Greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Welcome to Online Worship with Ramona Avenue Christian Church. I'm Dr. Matt, and I want to welcome you to this time of worship. Uh, whether you've been with us all through the pandemic, whether you're with us before that, or if you're finding us just for the first time, welcome. A few words about today's service. Uh, we will be taking communion later, so if you want to find something to, to eat and something to drink, we'll partake together um, later on. Also, uh, we're doing our every other week thing, so this is our online week. Next Sunday will be our next uh, drive-in worship, so you can join us at 909 Juanita Avenue in Laverne. Um, and yes, we're located on Juanita Avenue, and we're Ramon Avenue Christian Church. It's the corner of Juanita and Ramona, so yeah. Go figure. It's a long story. Um, <laughs> you can come join us next Sunday and find out about it. Um, so, other things about the service today. Um, now yesterday, um, if you're watching this on Sunday, uh, further back if not, um, was the 20th anniversary of the 9-11 attacks, the September 11th, 2001 attacks, uh, terrorist attacks in New York, Washington, and then the um, plane that uh, United 93 that went down in uh, Pennsylvania. And I'll be saying a little more about the prayer time, but the our special music today is a piece that Wes composed um, for the 10th anniversary, so 10 years ago. And uh, I've, I've put some new images to it. Um, and I, just as a content warning, uh, there are images of kind of devastation. So uh, just to prepare you. Um, or maybe you skip that part if that's going to be too triggering. Um, so I've, now we're singing some songs. Uh, you'll notice that the songs today uh, feel might feel a little uh, Advent or Christmas esque, and uh, and that that's okay. We, you know, I I like singing Joy to the World at Easter because it actually fits really well there. Um, but you know, these songs, these songs kind of work and the scripture today really kind of lends itself to, to these two, these particular songs that we're going to sing. So, um, don't, uh, don't think that, uh Oh, pastor's gone off his rocker. He forgot what time of year it is. Okay. It's not Christmas in September. Um, and let's see what else. Uh, we'll be hearing from our general minister and president, Terry Hord Owens, also um, reflecting on the 20th anniversary of 9-11. Um, and we've got Chris reading the scripture for us. And then at the end, we'll have a, a nice little postlude by Wes as well. So as we move into our time of worship, um, I invite you to join me in a breath prayer. And um, this time, let's use the phrase, salvation has come. Um, it, it fits with the, the passage that we're going to be looking at later, because yes, we are continuing our summer of Revelation. We're up to chapter 12, so we're past the halfway point of the book now, and uh, things are going to get kind of odd again. So salvation has come. So I invite you to join me and take a couple of deep breaths to kind of release the stress of the week there we go. salvation has come salvation has come Salvation has come. Salvation has come. Thanks be to God. Amen. And I invite us to sing together the Lord's Prayer.
Hello, disciples. This weekend, we mark the 20th anniversary of the terrorist attacks on the United States on September 11th, 2001. Anniversaries are often difficult and poignant times. Earlier this week, I participated in a trauma response roundtable with several leaders from our church, a military chaplain, a hospice chaplain, a minister who's researching moral injury, and the associate director of Week of Compassion, who is uh, always in trauma response, and the new director of our mental health initiative at MBA. As we all discussed our memories of 9-11, I personally remember being at home, taking a mental health day, watching the Today Show on NBC, and seeing live that second plane hit the second tower, and later transfixed and traumatized by the images I was seeing, watching those towers fall. I have a cousin who at the time lived in upper Manhattan, and we couldn't get to her. It was a couple of days later before she was able to reach out to let us know that she was okay. Some of you may have known family members or friends who were lost on that horrific day. We know that the society in which we live was forever changed by how we move in and out of airports, even how we think of certain parts of the world. We have in some cases descended into a form of bigotry that is not reflective of the limitless love we should be showing for all of God's humanity. And we have carried within our bodies the memories of 20 years of war and sadness. The Apostle Paul wrote to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 4, we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. As we reflect on those attacks nearly 20 years ago, we find ourselves in a situation where the pandemic still swirls viciously around us. We have watched one more time as desperate refugees struggle to leave a land torn by war. We continue to be in economic ups and downs and we grieve the loss of more than 700,000 lost to COVID in the United States more in Canada. You may have lost a loved one. You may have lost a friend. You may still feel in your body the traumatic memory and loss of 20 years ago. But remember the words of Paul, we are afflicted but not crushed, perplexed but not driven to despair, persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed. As a church family, as part of the one body of Christ, we are a movement for wholeness. And part of that wholeness is not that we will not grieve, not that we will not know trauma, but that we will among ourselves, with and for each other, create communities where care is possible, where healing is possible, and where hope is always present. On this very important anniversary, I pray for your peace and for the peace of the United States and Canada, and for peace around our world. It's in the name of the Prince of Peace that I know that this is possible. So thank you, disciples, for listening today. And remember that God loves you, and so do I. So church, as we come to our time of prayer today, um, probably at the forefront of most of our minds today is uh, the 9-11 attacks. Uh, Yesterday was the 20th anniversary of those attacks on the World Trade Center, the Pentagon, and then the um, the one that was foiled and that crashed in um, Pennsylvania. 
United Flight 93. 20 years. It's hard to believe it's been that long. Um, if you're, I, I assume that probably most of you watching this um, could tell me what you were doing that day and what happened when you found out. Um, out here on the West Coast, you know, we're a few hours behind, so uh, my alarm went off in the morning, my clock radio back when I had such a thing, um, and I had it set to come on with the radio, and it was the local NPR station, uh, National Public Radio, and so I'm, you know, my alarm goes off, and I'm hearing this really odd news coming over as I'm waking up, and I was, you know, a little out of it, and it's like, wait a second, what? What are they talking about? Planes crashing? So then, of course, I go and I turn on the, the news, and it's just all over. And, you know, the video of planes crashing into the World Trade Center, and as we find out, you know, over the next hours and days what, what actually was going on. And I remember one of my first impulses was, I should go open the church. Um, I wasn't at Ramona Avenue at that point. I've, I've only been here almost 10 years. Um, but I was at another church, and I was... I, so I called the pastor, um, our pastor, and uh, the senior pastor. I was associate. And and um, he had been called up as part of a, a, a disaster response kind of team of clergy and other other people. Um, and so he was involved in that. And so I said, well, okay, I'll, I'll go open up the church because it felt like the kind of day where people might just want to pray. And so I went to the church, um, opened up, you know, opened the doors, left the doors wide open, set out some chairs. I ended up pulling in the, the TV that we had. I pulled it into the sanctuary and, and had the news on. And uh, a few people came by um, to just spend some time you know, to talk, to pray, um, not a lot, but it just felt like the right thing in that moment. Uh, Jenny and I were actually, uh, had planned to, uh, teach a class for, uh, 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 her boss. I don't remember if he was her boss at that time, but at some point he was. Um, he taught, um, and had asked us to step in because he had to go away for a conference or something. And his flight was grounded, so he ended up teaching the class anyway so we just went to that and I, I remember one of the, th the thing that really struck me was that he didn't start class he just went in and taught class like normal he didn't do anything or say anything to acknowledge what had happened that day which struck me as very odd but it, I think in those first hours and days we none of us really knew quite what was going on and or how to respond but it's been 20 years, and there's been a lot that's happened since. And there have been a lot of effects of those events of that day on our lives. Um, increased security when you go on a plane. Uh, increased security around federal buildings. You know, different kinds of security threats and tests and things all over. And then, of course, two wars in Afghanistan, which just the last U.S. troops just left. Um, what I heard barely a week ago, uh, a little more than that. And, um, yeah. And I remember in those early days how it felt like we were united as a country and people came together and were helping one another out. And there was this sense of, of commonality and, um, and there was the rescues going on, people coming from all over the country to Ground Zero and to you know Washington and so on to help out with the rescue and recovery efforts. Um, but then there was a lot of ugliness that came with it too. Um, you know, we started going after these terrorists, the war on terror, and and to this day, I really wonder what would have happened if we'd approached it as an international crime event. If we looked at it as a massive crime that needed to be, you know, that, that we track down the people and bring them to justice, 
uh, rather than going into war stance, which took us, well, just got out of Afghanistan after almost 20 years. And there was torture committed by our government. There were pictures out of the Abu Ghraib prison of prisoners being mistreated horribly. There's a lot of ugliness that came out of that as well. So what do we do with that over the past 20 years? I don't know. We mourn with those who mourn. Weep with those who weep. We remember. And we take stock. You know, have we become a better people? over the past 20 years? Have we become a better nation? Have we lived out our faith? Of course, there are many other prayer concerns. The situation in Afghanistan after we've pulled out, and we're going to need to be praying for the refugees, for all the people who are going to be coming to our country from Afghanistan and to other nations as well, and trying to restart their lives start over again with something new and so I want to find ways to be welcoming and open to uh, people who need help of course situation in Haiti continues and there's still cleanup and all from Hurricane Ida and of course the Delta variant of the coronavirus continues to rage around the world and in our own country um, I just read a statistic that people who are, let's see, people are 11 times more likely to die of COVID if they're unvaccinated. If that doesn't convince you, then I don't know what will. Um, 11 times more likely to die if you're not vaccinated. Oh, and uh, um, I think it was Chris texted me something this week, an article um, that I, I might be superhuman here. Because apparently, if you, uh, there's been, there's, a, it's a pretty limited study, but they're wanting to expand it. But that people who were infected with COVID, who got COVID back in two, 2020, and I, I had it back in uh, February and March of 2020, so very early on, before you could really even get tested and so on. But um, people who got, who did that, and then later this year, got the one of the mrna vaccines um most of them if not all uh, apparently get this like just super like this, this the article called it like superhuman immunity just this really strong immunity out of that so um please god let me have that <laughs> since i had it and then i got the shot so and i had pretty bad side effects from the shots most likely because I'd had it before. So uh, hopefully, you know, maybe I got a, a superhuman um, immune response. But, uh, you know, so even if people have been infected with it um, at some point, it's still worth getting the vaccine because it only boosts. It's only going to make your immunity stronger and more long-lasting. Uh, for our prayer itself, I, I want to share with you part of a prayer. Um, I'll also pray around it, but I want to share part of a prayer with you um, by the Reverend uh, Ann Cansfield, who was a, a chaplain for the for the um, Fire Department of New York. Um, she um, wrote this prayer for the 20th anniversary, um, and she's a United Church of Christ minister, our sibling denomination. Uh, so... Uh, I'll use her prayer as our prayer. So let us pray. God, we come to you on this day, 20 years after a day that we will never forget. And so God, we pray In the words of the chaplain of the Fire Department of New York, we pray, we pray for the fallen. They're the ones we love so dearly and miss so deeply. 
We have entrusted them to you and ask you to continue to embrace them in your love. We don't really have to tell you, God, since you already know, but we'll say it again. The ones who have died and who we entrust to your care are some of the best people. Wise, brave, compassionate, joyful, whip-smart, and really humorous. They are family, friends, neighbors, and colleagues. They are your beloved children. We also pray for the crestfallen. This day marks a time of so much sadness and grief for so many. We ask for your care and comfort for the living. Remind us again and again that you are with us and you always have been. And so, God, we offer this prayer from the chaplain to you. And we do pray for all the fallen and the crestfallen. It's in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. A great portent appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. She was pregnant and was crying out in birth pangs, in the agony of giving birth. Then another portent appeared in heaven, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his heads. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. 
Then the dragon stood before the woman who was about to bear a child, so that he might devour her child as soon as it was born. And she gave birth to a son, a male child, who was to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. But her child was snatched away and taken to God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared by God, so that there she can be nourished for 1,260 days. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. The dragon and his angels fought back, but they were defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. The great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent, who was called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven proclaiming, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. For the accuser of our comrades has been thrown down, who, who accuses them day and night before our God. But they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they did not cling to life, even in the face of death. Rejoice then, you heavens and those who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you with great wrath, because he knows that his time is short. So when the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. But the woman was given the two wings of the great eagle, so that she could fly from the serpent into the wilderness, to her place where she is nourished for a time, and times, and half a time. Then from his mouth the serpent poured water like a river after the woman, to sweep her away with the flood. But the earth came to the help of the woman. It opened its mouth and swallowed the river that the dragon had poured from his mouth. Then the dragon was angry with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her children, those who keep the commandments of God and hold the testimony of Jesus. Then the dragon took his stand on the sand of the seashore. So church, uh, last week we saw uh, toward the end of the passage in chapter 11, that the kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. And that's that's why we sang the Hallelujah Chorus. Um, and it's almost as if now the, the story shifts a bit to show how that is happening. And so the next two chapters, um, I've titled this one Conflict in Heaven, and then next week it's Conflict on Earth. And um, one of the features of apocalyptic literature, now I may have to back up just a hair here, <laughs> apocalyptic, right? The very first word of the book is apocalypsis, right? This is the revelation or the unveiling, the uncovering. Um, and this book, the whole book is, is this kind of, this uncovering, this revelation, right? Apocalyptic literature is a particular kind of writing, and we see it here in Revelation, we see it in the book of Daniel, um, we see bits of it in the Gospels and some other places. It's, it has this particular worldview, and part of that is that heaven and earth are interconnected somehow the spiritual realm and the physical realm the you know the world beyond and the in the current world some you know however you want to think about it and actually i'm looking here and i can see here i've almost got like a two parts to my background here right there's this painting and below it there's just the paint of the wall it's as if those things are really connected and so what happens in heaven is is affects what happens on earth and vice versa what happens on earth will affect the heavens and so the next two chapters we really get um, a series of of kind of images symbols um, the NRSV here translates this a 
in 12.1, a great portent appeared in heaven. And uh, the, wor the word there is like a symbol, a sign. All right, so this great symbol occurs in heaven. Okay, so right off the bat, it's telling us this is a symbolic image here. This is a, a vision uh, that is full of symbols and is not, not literal. And so what we're going to see in this chapter, chapter 12, is this vision of how all this is playing out in heaven, in the heavenly realms, the spiritual realm. And the next chapter, chapter 13, will be what that looks like in the earthly realm and on, on the earth. So, um, and then just as a little foreshadowing, um, the end of chapter 13, so what we'll get to next Sunday, is where we hear about um, the mark of the beast and the number, right, 666. I'm not going to talk about that today, but something to look forward to next Sunday. What does it mean? Well, first, we turn to the heavens. So a great portent appeared in the heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of seven stars. And she's pregnant. Right. Now, I'll just pause there for a moment because this image of a divine or some kind of great woman who's, who is pregnant um, was an image that was known in that part of the world. Um, the, the idea of kind of a, a goddess or some sort of, of woman who gives birth was a the, the mother of heaven, the queen of heaven. These were images or ideas that were used in um, in the religions uh, of the, the of the Roman Empire and in particular the part of Asia Minor what he calls Asia in this book the western part of Turkey right where these letters to the seven churches went in that part of the of the world these were particularly um, significant so uh, this this image of the kind of the queen of heaven, this mother, this heavenly mother, or something like that, uh, also made its way into the Roman uh, imperial cult. So the worship of the emperor and the emperors. Um, Roma, Rome, was imagined as a as a woman, as a goddess, right? And so you have the goddess Rome, in essence, and so um, so. A couple of connections to our area. The um, in Pergamum, remember, which was one of the t seven churches, there was a coin found in Pergamum that has a a picture of this, a depiction of the um, the the uh, Queen of Heaven image, and then the idea is that her son then was the incarnation of Apollo, and we saw that we've seen that from previous right that that. Um, some of the emperors identified themselves as the incarnation of Apollo. So this, this imagery of the queen of heaven, the heavenly mother, giving birth to a leader um, was picked up in the Roman cult as well. And in fact, Smyrna, one of the other of the seven churches, um, was a big center of, of worship of, the, of this um, kind of heavenly heavenly mother figure this queen of heaven and so what we get here is something that would have been familiar it would have been a familiar image to the people reading this in that part of the world a great portent appears in heaven a woman clothed with the sun moon at her feet crown of stars on her heads 12 stars notice right 12 apostles 12 um, tribes of israel had 24 elders which is two times 12 all right, she's pregnant, and then it says she was crying out in birth pangs in the agony of giving giving birth. Giving birth. Now that part, the idea that she was in travail, that she's in agony, that she's, um, you know, in pain, that was not part of this this imagery. It's not part of the imperial cult or any of that. This seems to pull from the Old Testament, right? You have these images of the suffering Savior and so on. Um, Right, so this is the first port, right? And then it says, then another port, another symbol, another sign appeared in heaven, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his heads. Now, who is this 
this red dragon? Well, we're going to find out in a few verses. I think it's verse 10. Let me just look here real quick. Nope, not verse 10. Verse 9. <laughs> Got a little too far. Verse 9 says, The great dragon was thrown down. That ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan. The deceiver of the whole world. Okay? So, this is who. So, it's revealed pretty quickly to us that this, this red dragon, right, is symbolic of the devil or Satan. The powers of, of evil opposed to God's people. Right? So, this great red dragon comes, and it says, Then his tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven, threw them to the earth. Then the dragon, this is a strange image, right? And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to bear, the, bear, the ch bear a child, so that he might devour her child as soon as it was born. Okay? So the dragon, the devil, Satan, is obviously feels threatened by this child and gets down there and is ready, right? As soon as that kid's born, going to eat him up, devour the child. Then it says she gave birth to a son, a male child who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. Now, who is this male child? Now, there is a lot of speculation about who exactly this woman represents and who the child is. It's probably a whole combination of images, in fact, because one way to read it is it's, it's Mary giving birth to Jesus, right? Jesus is the one who's going to rule and, and so on. But it could also be the, the people of Israel as the mother, and they give birth to the Messiah. Um, another idea is that it's the Messianic community that gives birth to the body of Christ, right? The body of Christ, right? Um, in whatever whatever sense you go, basically the the devil, the the red dragon, wants to get this child, and it makes sense, right? The child is dangerous to the dragon. It says she gave birth to a son, okay, but her child was snatched away. Oh no, the dragon! Nope. It says that her child was snatched away and taken to God and to His throne, and the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God so that can, she can be nourished for, guess how long? 1,260 days. It's the same amount of time that those witnesses were prophesying, right? It's three and a half years. So the woman is able to flee into the wilderness. The child is taken up to God and... The dragon is left out of luck. You can remember this is all meant to be symbolic, but it's basically showing that the that God is protecting and taking care of God's people and God's Messiah. Right? The uh, the woman manages to hide in the wilderness, which of course calls to mind God's provision of for the people of Israel after the Exodus. Right? They went in the wilderness. They were there for 40 years. God took care of them. And of course, the child going up to the throne. Right, This, is, this seems like the Messiah. Then we get to verse 7. War broke out in heaven. So, right, this great dragon is not happy about what's just happened. Right, The child's been taken up to the, to the throne. The woman has escaped into the wilderness. War breaks out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. Michael the archangel, right? They were defeated, right? The dragon and his angels fought back, but they were defeated. And there was no longer any place for them in heaven. This is significant because of what's going to happen in the next chapter, right? So the dragon is defeated. The great dragon was thrown down and that's there's here's where it gives the identification of the devil and satan the deceiver of the whole world he was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him okay so just to kind of sum up what we've seen so far this great symbol of this woman right the queen of heaven roma whatever 
she gives birth. The child is protected by God by t- being taken to God. The woman is able to escape to the wilderness, also protected in a place where God had protected God's people before. This is all imagery that plays around with imperial cult images so that it's almost like an anti-Rome, right? Then we get this war where Michael and the angels fight against the dragon and his angels, and the dragon and the angels with him are defeated. And then verse 10, we get a loud voice in heaven proclaiming, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. Right? It's almost a reflection of what we heard last chapter. The accuser of our comrades has been thrown down. This is a key line because the accuser, um, accuser, the word accuser, is um, it's an unusual term that's used here, but the Hebrew or the yeah the Hebrew uh, Satan, Ha Satan, the Satan, uh, it means the accuser. So that is where we get the word Satan is it is a Hebrew word that means accuser. And so the, the Satan, this dragon, the devil, is the one who accuses the people before God. It's almost a judicial kind of image. And now it says the accuser of our comrades has been thrown down. He accuses them day and night before God. So the, the one who is accusing us before God, the one who is trying to get us in trouble with God, has been thrown down and says they have conquered him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony they didn't cling to life in face of death and so on and rejoice you heavens okay verse 12 gives us the transition right rejoice then you heavens and those who dwell in them but woe to the earth and the sea for the devil has come down to you with great wrath because he knows his time is short so you see what's happening here you have this dragon, Satan, being defeated in the, in the heavenly realms, right? In the spiritual realm. And then the only place to go is to the earth. So from here, really, through the next chapter now, the scene shifts from heaven to earth. Because remember, apocalyptic, one affects the other. So what happens in heaven affects the earth and vice versa. So... Then we get the last part of chapter 12. The dragon saw he'd been thrown down to the earth. It says he pursued the woman. Because remember, the woman was, had fled into the wilderness. The child was up with God, tucked away safe. But the woman was given. Now, watch how God provides for this woman. The woman was given the two wings of the great eagle so that she could fly from the serpent into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time, three and a half years, which equals the amount of time we're told earlier that she was nourished. So it, it's almost as, right, the t- it's, it's not chronological. <laughs> we're backing up a little, like, we're like, okay, so remember I told you the woman went off into the wilderness, she fled to the wilderness, well, this is how that happened. The, the, the dragon was thrown down to earth. The woman was given these wings of an eagle and took off into the wilderness. Now, these wings of the, the great eagle, I just a little aside here. Um, this past week, I got a copy of a new translation of the New Testament called First Nations Version. And uh, it's brand new. It came out, it was, uh, I think, August 31st, it, it was released. And um, I got it. it and it's fascinating. It, it's it was it's translated with the language and perspective and kind of storytelling sense of uh, the northern native peoples, uh, North uh, North American native peoples. So First Nations is a term often used in Canada, um, and. This part, this part, when I read this chapter in it, because of course I got it, I was like, oh, I should see what it has to say about how I, how they translated this, and the this part about the great eagle, it's like, oh, you can totally see this in kind of you know Native American uh, iconography or or imagery, right? That he was given, she was given wings of 
great eagle and they you know and she flies off into the wilderness and she's taken care of for these three and a half years and then the serpent comes verse 15 from his mouth the serpent poured water like a river after the woman to sweep her away with the flood and and if you if you've been to a desert if you live in desert say i don't know southern california um, you know that when rain really hits hard, you get these flash floods, right? It doesn't, it'll not rain and not rain for a long time. And then when it does, it's just this deluge. And we have like rivers running down some of our streets around here. So that's kind of what I have in mind here, right? The massive flood coming. But I absolutely love what it says in verse 16. But the earth came to the help of the woman it opened its mouth and swallowed the river that the dragon had poured from his mouth the earth came to the help of the woman so this woman the, representing mary the messianic community the people of israel whatever the church is protected from the from the devil from this dragon by the earth itself. The earth itself comes to our aid, comes to her aid. That's, that's powerful. Now then the dragon was angry with the woman, <laughs> couldn't do anything to her because the earth's protecting her. The earth itself is protecting her. So then uh, it says he went off to make war on the rest of her children, those who keep the commandments of God and hold the testimony of Jesus. Right. And then the dragon took his stand on the sand of the seashore. And so the, so the passage ends with the dragon being thwarted, not being able to devour the child, not even be able to get at the mother, and then goes off to war with her other children. And that's what we're going to see in the next chapter. So a couple of key takeaways from this chapter 12. So I guess one is that we're shown this image of this woman in heaven who is would have been a common image also representing rome and that it's subverted to talk about god's people and the messiah jesus and the dragon the devil is fought by michael and his angels cast out of heaven goes after the woman but the woman is protected by the earth itself. The earth itself comes to her aid. The dragon is unable, it's thwarted. It's not able to attack the Messiah. It's not able to attack the, the blessed community represented by this uh, queen of heaven. And so goes off to make war on the rest of God's children. And then the De the dragon, the devil, the, the Satan, the Satan, is on the earth. Woe to the earth, right? Is that what they said? They said, Woe to the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down among you with great wrath because he knows his time is short. The forces of evil have been defeated in the heavenly realms. The forces of evil have been cast out of the spiritual realm. And the only place they have to go is to the earth to cause trouble. And next week we'll see what kind of trouble that that brings. For now, though, we can see that God has the authority and the power to cast this devil out of heaven and to protect the woman uh, on the earth. So, so let us pray. God, we thank you for these strange images and the ways that we are learning from them, that you protect your people, you care for your people, and you give them an out. You mount us up on wings like an eagle's, you help us to fly away, and the earth itself comes to our rescue. Thank you, God. Thank you. In the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen.
And now as we prepare to come to Christ's table, um, we're going to sing together, uh, Sing of Mary, Pure and Lowly. And this is a song that maybe sounds a little Advent-y, <laughs> as I mentioned at the beginning. Um, but it, it sings of this woman who gives birth to the child, right? And uh, just as you're th singing, um, keep in mind this chapter, right? Where the woman is protected, the woman representing not just Mary herself, but the, the community of God's people, and that the child is the messianic one who has come uh, to rule and to save. So as we prepare to, prepare to Christ, come to Christ's table, let us sing. Welcome to Christ's table. God, please pour out your Holy Spirit on us as we gather and on your gifts that we receive. On the night, the same night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread and he gave thanks. Blessed are you, Lord our God, ruler of the universe who brings forth bread from the earth. And he gave it to them saying, take, eat, this is my body broken for you. Do this to remember me. And then he gave, took a cup and again he gave thanks. Baruch atah pare hagafen. Blessed are you, Lord our God, ruler of the universe, the creator of the fruit of the vine. And he gave it to them saying, drink all of you, do this to remember me. And I tell you the truth, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. Let us pray. Lord God, pour out your Holy Spirit on us as we gather, as we receive the bread and the cup your body and your blood, and help us to sing with those redeemed from the earth. Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and always. 
Amen. The body of Christ broken for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. Thanks be to God for the gifts of God, for the people of God. of invitation today is when God is a child and yes you're going to notice as we sing it that it sounds like and in fact it is an Advent hymn uh, each verse for a different Sunday of Advent but given the scripture we just looked at the child is being you know whisked off into the wilderness and all it seemed like an appropriate um, song and I I will just I think I've said this before but I'll say it again I absolutely love the last line and none shall be afraid and i'm like yes please so uh as we sing this is our opportunity to commit ourselves and recommit ourselves to the god who is willing to come as a child and live among us and show us the way so let us sing <laughs> Let us go now with benediction. May God be above us to watch over us. May God be beneath us to lift us up. May God be ahead of us to lead us. May God be behind us to push us. May God be beside us to walk with us. And may God be within us to love us forever. Amen. <laughs>